take that out 2000 but you have the NASB 1995 ESV NIV uh, New King James King James is accurate but it's really hard to read unless you get into uh, but those are the probably the top four the Holman Bible is another Bible that's accurate in regards to the Greek lineup and to terminology as well I yeah, Christian Standard Bible. There's about five or six that are rated at the top for not being loose in the interpretation. You're right. Hey, yep. That's right. You're right. And that is... That is the problem, and the problem that really is is inundating now with any revision, I'd say after 2019, with the disregard for what MacArthur and, and their their scholars, Old Testament, uh, Hebrew, and Greek scholars are doing now for the legacy. Anything I would say probably from 2017, 18 on, when you look, you're going to really have to look at the Bible, not only for terminology, but for cultural relevance things that they're going to try. So if you don't know the Bible, you're going to be swayed. Uh, so yeah, it is going to get more and more difficulty because people are going to pick Bibles that are going to tickle their ears. Yeah. Yeah. I like, I have a copy. Of... Yeah. That's right, and that's 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 true, and that's why when you get the Bible, uh, if you've had in time with the Bible, you can look and see what the differences are. I've been following the Legacy Bible very carefully. They they give up updates. Matter of fact, I have the New Testament, Proverbs, and Psalms Legacy Bible, and it's really I can go back and look at the old versions that I have that before all this garbage started, and I can see that they've lined up except they're using the correct names of God, like Yahweh, El Shaddai, uh, that terminology. They line up pretty much what the New Testament Bible I got when I was six years old. So, But there I looked at other Bibles where they really, really try to make Jesus more human and less God. Because after he's less human, more human, less God, then it doesn't really affect us that much. So, yeah, we do need to be careful. You're absolutely right. And uh, and the other way is if the pastor uses a version and can explain it, not just from what he thinks, but you can go back and actually understand some of the interpretations, then he can help you get a good Bible. He can at least teach properly. Yeah, Masoretic texts and... Well, that's why I trust the pastors. Pastors that I know and I believe that they teach the Word of God without error. Pastors that I know that historically, like Dr. MacArthur has been the pastor of his church, the same church for over 50 years. And he, he is in trouble because he adheres to the Word of God as it was written, not as people as are interpreting it right now. He's the one that stood up in California. And uh, I've followed Dr. MacArthur since I left the Assemblies of God. I've followed him since 2009. And uh, the only trouble I've... Huh? Yep. Well, I, no, I would just tell you, if you listened, Dr. MacArthur's been there 50 years, and it's funny. I listened to a sermon last week, and I go, man, this guy's right on. I looked at the date of that sermon. It was 1972. It was 1972 when he was criticizing or nailing what's happening today. And if you look in that, in his messages, and they're worldwide, you just listen to him. He's consistent. If you listen to him teach Romans 8 verses 1 through 5 today, there might be some nuances as he's grown and learned in the scripture. But you're going to get pretty close to the same message as you got 19, you know, and he's preached through the entire New Testament. The entire New Testament. 
And so, verse by verse, line by line. And if you look at him preaching today in 2021, you listen to today's sermon, and if you could go back and just get an idea of what he's talking about. Let's say he's talking on Romans 5. And you look on his website, you go back to Romans 5, and you see a date on it, it's going to be so close. And you're going to say, well, that seems terrible. It's the same message. The message never changes. <laughs> Oh, no, 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 that, that part of the, the, you know, that's part of the Bible study. Because you can't learn the true character of God if you don't have the Word of God. You only, you can learn the character of God the way people want you to learn if they have a wrong version. Just like here, Jesus stoned her himself and said, I am a sinner. Now for the world, they'd say, well, man, he's just like me. Wrong, wrong Jesus. See? So I agree, and I, I think it was great. I mean, I encourage that. That's what this Bible says. This is not a preaching time. This is to address questions. And uh, like I said, when I want to look, I've, 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 and uh, bless his heart, Dr. MacArthur uh, and uh, others that I know of that I've, since I've cut, left the assemblies and really started studying Scripture. Matter of fact, just to let you know, my next classes I'm signing up for that I start on Tuesday are hermeneutics, how to study Scripture, and biblical theology, how to take the text to make sure I'm using the right text, getting the right results. And that's why I like this college I'm going to. Uh, so, because that's, that's what I want to do, is bring you the right word. And if your Bible differs from mine, then we need to look and find out why. And if it's because somebody has put something in there or changed the word, just like the word this morning, uh, committed. We look at that and say, okay, well, I understand committed. Yeah, but you weren't committed, you were delivered into. That is how the word really means. And the word delivered to is a lot better, is a lot different than commit. Because I could be committed to something. But if I'm delivered into it by Christ, there's more authority, there's more power. And it takes me out of the picture. All I'm doing is committing to what was delivered to me that's going to sustain me. So it's, it's those kind of things that we have to look at. Brenda, Brenda, I don't think we're going to give him your name. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. That's what. <laughs> That's all right. We'd understood what you meant here. Now north they wouldn't, but we'd understand it here. I don't. Seven. Okay, let's we any more?
Okay, let's open in prayer. We'll go ahead and start our study. Father, we just thank you for this night of study, your word. We love your word, Father, and we desire to grow in it. As we study your attributes, who you are, let it not just be head knowledge, but move in our hearts so we would know in our hearts that we would be comforted by your attributes and your character. I thank you for those who are here tonight. I pray your blessings on them. In Christ's name, amen. Now, actually, that was a good conversation to start because the main focus of Scripture is to focus on God. <laughs> if it doesn't focus on God, if the emphasis becomes man, you're in the wrong Bible. It focuses on God. It, it's, as someone said, it's his story. It begins with him and it ends with him. And it's his plan of restoration for his creation. But it's him. He is the center. He is the focus. If you listen to what I just read from the Chinese, it's not God that's got the emphasis. It's, it's the humanity to be able to identify with someone in the humanness. Only a divine purpose person could say, go and sin no more. And that's not what you want your people to understand, that there's somebody greater than you that's going to become at odds with you if you're not a Christian because the values and the beliefs you have for that person, you're willing to die and you're willing to live differently. And I think that is what you look at. That's what you need to listen to. If anything gets away from the focus of God and begins to show the heartstrings of man and emphasis on man and not who God is, you're going down to trouble. Because remember, I said you are more holy than you are a sinner in regards to your spiritual. You still have your fleshly desires. But if you're going through a time and you hear somebody on a radio, you hear a story that you're in trouble, but you can have your best life now if you just believe in yourself. Or if you just do X, Y, and Z. And you don't look at Scripture to see what Scripture says. You know, this whole thing that started with self-esteem is not biblical. God does not want you to have self-esteem. Self-esteem is pride. He wants you to be humbled and trust in Him. To have who you are based on Him, not on who you are as an individual. Because you can be Nelson Rockefeller. You can be Donald Trump. You can be anybody you want to be. But if you're a sinner, you're nothing. You're nothing. You want people to be like that? You want your children to be like that, successful in the world? Or you want your children to grow up to be more like Christ? Humble. Right? Giving. Caring. That's, that's the choice we make. We see a successful person, whether he's an athlete, and you say, be like this person. Now, all of you are of the same age as a little older, but you understand. The Wheaties box. The Olympics, I want to be like Bruce Jenner. He grew up looking at that, the decathlon winner. Had the greatest points in the Olympics. Today, he's, he's a woman. Did you want your child to grow up to be like Bruce Jenner? He's a woman. Changed everything. So you put your focus on the fleshly, which it's not wrong to tell your children to grow up to be successful. To, to, to work hard. That is good, but if you look in the Bible, the Bible says if you don't work, you don't eat. And you want them to be a good worker? It says do everything as if unto the Lord. You want to keep them humble? They do a great job. They get a paycheck. That's good. You just did what you were supposed to do. Yeah, the world gives you a bonus if you do a little bit more, show a little bit more achievement. But the point is, you want to be who you are but the question is, you want to be who you are according to the world or according to Christ? Because there is a difference in reputation. There's a difference in character. And that's why we're looking at the character of God. Because we have these attributes. And if we remember that all the attributes we've talked about, love, grace, all of this, were given to us by God. And when they were given to us at first, they were perfect. But sin has distorted them. Sin has changed it. It's gone from being God-centered to man-centered. I mean, what did Satan say? 
Did Satan tell uh, Eve and Adam that he was going to break their legs if they didn't do it? No. He says, he knows if you do this, you will be like God. You will be like God. He didn't say, Eve, you either take that apple or I'm going to just annihilate you. No, he coerced her with the flesh. And then the husband, he just gave in right away. Here, it looks good. Okay, I'll take it. But the point is, it's what we do and what we focus on that tells us whether we're going to represent the character of God or not. And that's why, again, going back to what Jim just asked, you get the wrong Bible, you're going to represent the wrong Jesus. I mean, the world is telling us today, if you really love God, then we can embrace everybody that's baptized because we're all God's children. We don't want to deal with the cults. We don't want to deal with the false religions. So we'll just all get together, and guess what? We'll all join together, and we'll all be happy together. And in our flesh, we say, well, that sounds great, except one thing. Light cannot dwell with darkness. That's Scripture. And you may say, well, Pastor, if that's the case, you're telling me if light can't dwell with darkness, then I'm going to have to separate myself from these people. And if I separate myself from these people, they're going to think I'm intolerant and bigoted. And they may not be my friends anymore. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm telling you. What's more important, your relationship with the world or your relationship with Christ? I can tell you they have the World Day of Prayer. At Savannah Riverside, we used to have a prayer at the pole. I never went. When I went the first time to look, I had a Muslim here. And I had somebody that I knew was over here was Jehovah Witness. I wouldn't join hands in them. What God am I praying to? The Bible says, don't be. You can say, well, we're all praying to the same God. No, we're not. We are not. Allah is not Jehovah. He is not. The only deity that we worship is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We don't worship, worship idols. We don't worship Buddha. We don't rub his little belly for good luck. And as much as it hurts because I have family members, Catholicism is the same way. Christ only goes halfway. The rest has to be the church. If the church has to be part of your salvation, then Christ died for nothing. These are things. We want to be together. We, ecumenicalism is what they call it. Syncretism is what you call when you're taking the things from the world and trying to bring in the church so you can be culturally relevant. But it comes to this. Who are you going to worship? Remember, once you're a self-surrendered slave, you cannot have your freedom. And sometimes worshiping the Lord God Almighty means that you are going to have to separate from friends. Because, not that you don't love them. And when I mean separate, it means you don't disown. You pray for them, but you know that the things you're doing together, if you're going to get together, it, it, it can't be spiritual. Because you have nothing in common. You have nothing in common. You're either worshiping light or you're worshiping darkness. There is no shade of gray in the spiritual world. They call that a double-minded person. Swayed to and fro by the, by the signs of the time. So we have to be careful. We have to have, make sure we have the right kind of Bible. And we need to make sure that when we read the Bible, we focus on one thing. Not what I can get out of the Bible, but what I can receive from God in order to give worship for what he's done. So, having said that, today we're going to look at the mercy of God. Number seven. The mercy of God. God's mercy describes him as perfectly having deep compassion for creatures, people, such that he demonstrates benevolent goodness to those in a pitiable or miserable condition, even though they don't deserve it. This definition is partly based on the word used in the original text of the Bible for mercy. In Hebrew, is rachamin. In Greek, it's elos akhtirmas, which means charity, pity, and compassion. Now, as with grace, this perfection does not consider the merit 
or lack of merit to the people to whom God gives mercy. We remember that grace, God's grace, gives us something we didn't deserve that we can be saved. God's mercy keeps us from instant justifiable judgment every day. He gives us grace and he gives us mercy. Without his mercy, there could be a lot of people who sin and even believers who are continuing in sin that could end up paying that cost. Hell is not the destination. But God is keeping his judgment at this time. And the following list of scriptures presents evidence for the mercy of God. Number one, it is a perfection or attribute of God. God is mercy. God is gracious. God is love. God is jealous. God is all, it, that's his essence again. That's number one. It is a perfection or attribute of God. Exodus 34, 6. I've just got a few. You've got the, I left you the verses to go home and study. Exodus 34, 6. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. If anybody says, what's your God like? Can you show me what your God's like? Go to Exodus 34, 6, because that's God showing himself, stating who he is to Moses. You remember at the beginning of the bush, he says, I am that I am, I am, I am. I am all that I ever have been, I'm all that I ever am presently, and I'm all that I ever will be eternally. I am, I exist. Deuteronomy 4.31 says, For the Lord your God is a compassionate God. He will not fail you, nor destroy you, nor forget the covenant with your fathers, which he swore to them. He's compassionate. It's his attribute. Second Chronicles 30, verse 9. For if you return to the Lord, your brothers and your sons will find compassion before those who led them captive and will return to this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and compassionate, and he will not turn his face away from him, from you if you return to him. I'm sure we're familiar with 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, we go, great, I like that. The other verse, most people don't continue on, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. He's compassionate. If you look at the entire book of Judges, what happened? The people messed up. They remembered God. They repented. He brought up a judge. He delivered them. That judge died, the people forgot. Then the people remembered God, they, and he, they prayed to him for restoration, and he gave them another judge, and that judge lived and ruled Israel for a while. We, we see that God is compassionate. When you repent, God is there to accept your repentance. He is there. He's compassionate. We know that his mercy, number two, it is manifold. That means it is Tremendous. There's, there's no end to it. Exodus 26, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You know, we, we think about the greatest mercy that he takes our sins and throws them as far from the east is to the west into the sea of forgetfulness. How far is that? How, how much is that? It's manifold. In Psalm 51, that's the psalm David wrote upon his repentance from his sin with Bathsheba. This is what the first two verses say in that on his manifold mercy. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. We see it, not a, you know, it's not according to my love. It's according to your loving kindness. Remember your word. According to the greatness of your mercy, blot out my transgressions. Be merciful. 
Daniel 9.18 Oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations in the city which is called by your name. For we are not presenting our supplications before you on account of any merits of our own, but on an account of your great compassion. They're saying, we know we have nothing of ourselves to offer you. So don't, don't judge us on that. Judge us based on your own compassion, on your own mercy, on the own promises of your word. His mercy does not fail. Does not fail. Lamentations 3.22 The Lord's loving kindness indeed never ceases, for his compassions never fail. We have a God who does not stop. He is compassion. It's not like he's just got a little section that he keeps. He, he is compassionate. He is yeah. merciful. He is kind. He is loving. And then when, when he describes himself as slow to anger and abounding in love, you and I try to understand what abounding is in our finite mind. When God says abounding, he's saying infinite I'm infinitely merciful. I'm infinitely loving. I'm infinitely kind. I'm infinitely just. It's not like there's just a limit to that. It's unlimited. It's infinite. Another thing about God's mercy, it is given to sinners after divine chastening. And I'm sure there's several of us, me included, that can remember what some of that chastening was like. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Number four, it is an aspect of God's paternal affection and care. I skipped that. I don't know why I wanted to get to the discipline. Paternal affection and care. Psalms 103.13, just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Now, you notice he said, as a father has compassion for their children. It shows that relationship between a father and a child. And then it says here, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him, his children, but he is the perfect father. His compassion is perfect. Now, number five, it is given to sinners after divine chastening. Isaiah 14, one, when the Lord will have compassion on Jacob and again choose Israel and settle them in their own land, then the strangers will join them and attach themselves to the house of Jacob. They were in a point of chastening. They had been sent into exile. And God is saying, then the Lord will have compassion on Jacob again and bring him back. I, when I was talking to Cindy a little bit about the, one, the story that keeps showing me his mercy and his grace and his love for his, his, his church is Hosea. God told Hosea to marry a prostitute, Gomer. And through the book, he's going after Gomer all the time and bringing her home. And you say, well, you'd think that Hosea would learn. No, if you think that, you're missing a point. We are Gomer. Christ is Hosea. He comes after us when we stray. That's that divine chastening. That's why in Hebrews we read, my son, don't faint lightly at the Lord's discipline. For whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. And I know for the first few years of my Christian walk, he must have loved me a lot. Because I was disciplined a lot. Because I had people telling me things that were in the Bible that were not, and they were contrary. And that's the way I was taught. And as I was coming out, it was just vacillating back and forth until the Lord finally got my attention to where I started studying the Word. Now, Isaiah 54, 8. In an outburst of anger, I hid my face for you, from you for a moment. But with everlasting loving kindness, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. Now, I looked up that verse because it says, wait a minute now, you said God doesn't get angry and lose his temper. Well, the word outburst in Hebrew, and I'm not good at Hebrew, is called se-sep, which means streaming or flow. In a flow or a streaming of 
anger, but that word anger is keset, which means judgment of anger. In and out, in a flow, in a flow of judgment of anger, I hid my face from you. He didn't lose his temper. He didn't lose his temper. He says, from a flowing judgment of anger. There was nothing that just on spontaneous. He said, at that point, there's going to be judgment of anger. And I can give you an example of a quick judgment of anger in the New Testament. Ananias and Sapphira. That was a quick judgment of anger. You lied to the Holy Spirit, boom. That was my judgment of anger. Why did he do that with them and nobody else? I don't know. But I imagine after those two people quit lying for a while about the Holy Spirit. Or to the Holy Spirit. But the point is, it's not God that God says, all right, I've had it. No. At that point, it's that judgment. Just judgment. It's like Jonathan and Edwards when he preached his sinners in the hands of the angry God. He said every, every sinner, everybody was on a, like a web, a spider web, and you were dangling over a fire. And God every day takes his little scissors and he goes here and goes here and he goes here and then he may clip here. And he states the reason why you weren't clipped today is because it didn't please God to bring judgment. In this case, it wasn't death judgment, but what he did is he hid his face, he turned away from them so that they would come under the judgment of men. So I wanted to clear that up unless you think, now wait a minute, we talked before, you said God doesn't lose his temper. He didn't. Jeremiah 12, 15 in that same vein says, and it will come about that after I have uprooted them, this is God judging his people, I will uproot them, I will again have compassion on them. I will bring them back, each one to his inheritance and each one to his land. But we can look at us today when we stray, can't lose our salvation. But what God does is he comes after. He brings you back. And you know what? You never lost your inheritance. He just brings you back home. Micah 7:19. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. Yes, you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea, the, the sea of forgetfulness. And it's not like God is forgetful that he doesn't have a mind to remember. He just chooses not to remember your sins. That's one thing I wish that we could do. You know, because if we didn't remember our sins and those desires, we would do a lot better on this earth. Number six, God is called the Father of mercies. 2 Corinthians 1.3, Paul writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the fathers of mercy, and I love this for all of us that have been going through stuff, so, and God of all comfort. You have a perfect God that will bring you comfort. You have a perfect God that will show you mercy. Number seven, God showed his mercy in Christ. Luke 1, 50 through 54, and his mercy is upon generation after generation towards those who fear him. He has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down rulers from their thrones and has exalted those who were humble. He has filled the hungry with good thing and sent away the rich empty-handed. He has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance. Listen, I like this. In remembrance of his mercy. He remembers his mercy. Number eight. Christ showed the mercy of God in his life on earth and as the great high priest in heaven. On earth, we can see in Matthew 9, 36, he's, Jesus seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. And then in Hebrews 2, 17, talking about his great high priest. 
Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, and to make perpetuation for the sins of the people. Now here's a question just to test our Bible knowledge. Jesus was from the tribe of Judah. He could become a king. He was a prophet. Deuteronomy said, how did he become a high priest? He wasn't in the tribe of Levi. You remember? Melchizedek. If you remember, Abraham gave his offerings. He came, he was met by the high priest of Salem, which was Jerusalem. A high priest who was the king of Jerusalem, who had no beginning and no end. And the Psalms, God tells Jesus, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. He was an eternal priest in the order of Melchizedek. I say that because somebody may ask you with the Bible, that your Bible's not true because I, how could Jesus be a priest, a king, and a prophet? They can give you the king and the priest or the king and the prophet because you can show that in Scripture. But where does Jesus fit in as a high priest? And that is because he is in the order of Melchizedek. Let me see if I can find that real quick here. Psalms 110.4, I think is what it said, if I can read. Yep. The Lord gives dominion to the king is the title of this psalm, and I'll just read it to you. Psalm 110, a psalm of David. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power. In holy array from the womb of the dawn, your youth are to be, your youth are to you as the dew. And we're showing about his kingship. Now in verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. That's your scripture verse. That's where Jesus was ordained a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Number nine. God gives mercy by providing salvation in all its aspects, including sustenance in the Christian life how the bread of life, the water, and final salvation at Christ's return. Romans 9.23, we read, And he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory. So he's making known the riches, but he prepared us, and he is continuing to fill us and prepare us to live on this earth. 2 Corinthians 4.1, Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we receive mercy, we do not lose heart. As you go through the times of struggle, as you go through those times where there seems to be a clash, the mercy of God will never depart from you. His compassion will be there. Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1 12, or 1 2, to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father. And Christ Jesus our Lord, giving him the tools, giving him what he needs to survive. In 2 Timothy 1 6, the Lord grant mercy to the house of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. We see that the Lord used somebody else to help Paul. That's where the church is so important. 
We're there for each other. We provide much needed encouragement and sustenance in life as believers to one another. Each and every one of us. 116. Each and every one of us, as we've said before, has a gift. And that gift to this body provides sustenance. It provides wherewithal so that we can live and walk and work in our Christian life. Each and every one of us. And I like that. For he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. I can tell you that there were times when we first started with the street ministry, when we were doing it, when somebody would get in trouble, you'd have this fear of, I don't want to be identified with them. You can't do that. You're there to strengthen a brother or a sister when they come under attack for their faith. It's not running from the fight. I've learned it was just like the military. One of the things I told somebody one time, it's amazing. Military, when you hear the shots, you don't run from them. You run to them. That's your job. You run to where the location is that something is happening. As Christians, it should be the same with us. We should go to help someone rather than a disassociate so we don't get in trouble. Like Tuesday, uh, I will be going to Columbia to join a group. Uh, they're going to be protesting abortions at the Capitol in Columbia. And I will be joining uh, David and a few other pastors as we go out there and listen to the people preach on uh, the abolition of uh, abortion. So that day, I will be associated with my brothers in Christ and sisters in Christ that are going to be speaking out against abortion. Uh, that's what we're to do. That's what we're to do. And uh, I'm going there to support him. So it's not running from the battle. As a soldier of Christ, you are to run to the Bible, being led by your captain and not by your experience through Scripture. And Jude 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. We wait anxiously for the mercy for the time that we cross over and can be with Christ. Now let's look at number 10. We're going to look at long-suffering. Long-suffering. I'm sorry, that was, let me make sure that was 10. Actually, I think it's not. My numbering system went wrong on my computer. Yeah, number seven was mercy. That's what we covered. This should be number eight on the side. Long-suffering. God's long-suffering speaks of his being perfectly placid in himself and towards sinners in spite of their continual disobedience and disregard for his warning. God does not lose his temper but rather acts calmly with proper affection according to his eternal sovereign plan. Tranquility implies not that God lacks affections, but rather that God's affections do not overwhelm him or cause him to act against his nature. We just got a few of these and we will... Number one on the scriptural evidence for God's long-suffering. Number one, God is patient with those deserving divine punishment. And we look at Exodus 34, 6 again, which I read earlier. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. In Nehemiah 9.17, we read, They refused to listen and did not remember your wondrous deeds which you had performed among them. So they became stubborn and appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. But you are a God of forgiveness, gracious, and compassionate, 
slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness, and you did not forsake them. Now, if you remember when Moses came down from the mountain, at that point, really, God had enough and there was going to be justice. And he asked, Moses said, those of you that are for the Lord, come over here. God had compassion and mercy on them. He didn't destroy them all. Those that came with Moses were on one side. Dathan and his crew were on the other. And Moses said, if these men, if this group dies a natural death, then it's not of the Lord. But if something un supernatural happens, like the ground opens up on them, then you know that it is God and we know the ground opened up. We see at that immediate time, we see his justice that happened to Dathan and crew and his mercy to those that were his. So we see justice and, mer uh, justice and mercy accomplished at the same time. And on one, they got grace and were saved and the others went into hell. Jeremiah 15, 15. You who know, O Lord, remember me. Take notice of me and take vengeance for me on your persecutors. Do not, in view of your patience, take me away. Know that for your sake, I endure reproach. Again, you see him pleading to, the, to who God is in his mercy. Not for my sake, but for your sake. For your sake, I endure reproach. Nahum 1.3, the Lord is slow to anger and great in power. And the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. In whirlwind and storm is his way, and clouds are the dust beneath his feet. And this is what I like. Number two, God was long-suffering before the time of Christ. God was long-suffering before the time of Christ. Romans 3.25, whom God displayed publicly as a perpetuation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in for the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. Why is God long-suffering now? Why does not God just come out and do his justice and take us home? Because God is long-suffering and patient. There are yet people to be saved. He doesn't destroy, he doesn't take us out because there are yet people to be saved. And when the all that he is going to save are saved, when he says it's over, then it will be over. So you say, how can God let everything go in this world? How can he let this suffering, how can he, I would say to you, because my daughter's not saved and maybe he's going to save her. I have grandchildren that aren't saved. Do, do I want him to come back now and take me home and have my grandchildren go to hell? You see, there's a purpose for what he does. And it's only our discomfort that makes us cry out, Lord Jesus, come quickly. I mean, it's the right thing to pray, but you look at it. Why do we want to go home now? Well, because we're saved and the rest, and the rest of this world is, is going to hell in a handbag. People are killing each other. They don't know if they're men or women. This world's in absolute chaos. But if we go back to Scripture and we remember that Jesus said it was going to be this way and that we are to endure, that word endure, remember? Persist. Persist in your faith against the persistence to quit. Persist in your faith. Another day that goes by that we look at the things of the world is another day we pray that our children and grandchildren and our family members will get saved. You see, that's the focus of Scripture, is not to focus on us, it's to focus on God's purpose and plan. Right? And God's will is that none should perish and all have everlasting life. So, our prayer is to say, Lord, give us strength to endure this time. Give us strength to go through this time, is actually saying, Lord, I want to go through this time and Lord, while I'm going through this time, I pray that my daughter and my grandchildren will be saved. I pray for my neighbor to be saved. There's a purpose. From the beginning at the fall, God has been patient and long-suffering. He destroyed everybody once. And he started anew. 
and he gave them a hope, a promise. A promise in Genesis at right before he destroyed the world, but that promise was lingering. He kept somebody going so that we would know that promise. And all of those who died believing in the promise, believing in the word of God, believing in what God said, were the ones that were waiting for Jesus to arise that day so they could go home. They were the ones in paradise. But to get to where he was with Jesus, he couldn't keep destroying it. So he was patient and he put up with all that he did in order for Christ to to come and to pay for the sins. And now he is patient still and long-suffering, willing and, and allowing us to go through all this chaos, all this, all this stuff that's happening in order for us as the church to be a light, to witness to the lost, that those who are gods would be saved before he comes back. That's our focus. That's our focus. Number three, and I'll quit with that for tonight. God's long-suffering is shown to sinners now, especially through Jesus Christ. Romans 2, 4. Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? He's kind to lead you to repentance. 2 Peter 3, 15. And regard the patience of our Lord. I love this and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you. I'm sorry, there's one left, so we'll do this. Number four, God is patient in not immediately responding to cries for justified vengeance. Revelation 6, 9 through 11 when the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And it was given to each of them a white robe, and they were told, that they should rest for a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed, even as they had been, would be completed also. Those of us that are alive are enduring in the faith to evangelize, to share the faith, and to equip the saints for that work. We're alive because God has a purpose for each member in this church, for all of us. And that member is not for that, that, that purpose is not for our purpose, it's for his. And when we come in and when we study the scriptures here and when you're at home, we should diligently be looking to see where God would have us be, what he would have us do. Because we're not here for our pleasure. And that's what the false Bibles are going to tell you. That you are here for your pleasure. You can have your best life now. You don't have to be sick if you just believe. If you give, you will receive. And they take that out of standard. They will take that to a degree of, if you give to me, God will give you more. I saw something this morning that really kind of amazed me. Towards the end of the year, we, we know that there were a lot of self-proclaimed prophets that prophesied that Trump was going to win. Kenneth Copeland, Jesse Duplantis, all that crew. Well, when you are a group that's in that faith and you come up with a policy that disavows the extremes that the group is doing, I think it's hilarious because there is a, a prophetic standard paper that was just signed by a lot of notable Pentecostals. And they're actually deny, they're actually saying that the guys like Copeland, the guys that, that did all this, they, they really weren't prophets. Although we can still get 
revelatory knowledge outside the scripture or prophecy. They're still holding on to the faults, but they're criticizing those who did the faults and were wrong. So a disassociation among the evil is, is really getting is really getting to be hilarious. You know, when I was a child, I remember being told that you can't legislate morality. And we know that didn't work. Jerry Falwell tried it with a moral majority. But the answer to legislating morality was basically, we will legalize immorality. And today, we are in a quandary. How do you call, at what point do you call immorality immoral? Where do you drive the stake now? I mean, we have gone from fornication, adultery, homosexuality, even the point now that the homosexual movement is saying pedophilia ought to be accepted because that is a part of who we are. You have that going on. You have people saying, now I'm identifying as a woman, so you have to talk to me as a woman. You're having people changing sexes. And then amidst all this chaos, you see in Los Angeles, in California, that Caitlyn Jenner, Bruce Jenner, is running for governor and has stood up and said that men, transgender men, should not be allowed to play in girls' sports. Anybody else see the irony in that other than me? It's, it's trying to appease, but still not addressing the fact that transgenderism is not right. Yeah, it's playing both sides of the fence. So that's the world that we live in. And it all happened because, well, because God ordained it, but because people were afraid to put their foot down and say, no, we're not going to have it. And I think for those of you that are older than me, you will know that in the early years from the 40s up through the, even up to the mid-60s, you could share the gospel and everybody knew about God. They knew about God. There was a moral thing about church. Today, if you were going to share the gospel, you'd have to begin at Genesis again to tell them where God came from, to tell them why we believe what we believe. It's, it's like Tuesday, and I've had this debate, you know, the, 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 over the issue of abortion. We as Christians know it's murder. The problem is, the world has said it's not. The world says it's acceptable. It's legal. So what we have to go do when you go deal with abortion is show them that there's a higher law than our federal government, and that comes from God. So you have to go back to the beginning to explain why it is wrong. Because when the answer is, well, I'm not doing anything that's illegal, says it's okay. And when you go into, yeah, but, but there is someone who's going to judge you on this does not agree with that, and he is God Almighty. And you need to hear me, because even if you don't believe it, one day you're going to come face to face with whom you don't believe, and it's going to be too late. So it's a beginning now of introducing God again to a generation whose idea of God is self. Itself. And the country and the government is endorsing that as well. So that's why it's important that we do what we're doing. It's important that, like Jim was saying, you find a good Bible and, um, and just diligently search the Scriptures for yourself and grow in the faith. Amen? Father, we just thank you for this day we've had with you, for your word. We thank you for your mercy and for your grace, for your love. And I pray for each member here tonight, Father, that you would bless them this week. You would strengthen them. You would encourage them. You would fortify them during times of intense circumstances and times of question and indecision. Father, you would lead and guide them in the right way. And that with all of us, you would continue to conform us to the image of your Son. Or it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.